Do you want to reach out to Japanese companies and universities? Then you must know what makes Japan special and different to have a smooth business experience. You want to get to the stage where everything is set up perfectly. And so a lot of underhandling or under the table discussions are needed. And uh, we say there are three things that we require from our clients. We need them to have an ambition. That's number one. Two, they need to have a budget for entering Japan. Mm -hmm. And three, we need to agree on how to do this. Different cultures means usually different rule sets and different ways to success. Japan is the second biggest market for pharmaceuticals globally. The area is not only interesting for its sales potential, but it is also an important R&D hub in Asia. One of the best experts in Japanese business culture in the life science get together community is Stefan Sandström. Stefan is a serial entrepreneur who lived his first life in Sweden and is now living his second life in Japan. He set up a business development consultancy in Japan aiming at the biopharma industry. After 15 years in Japan and partnering with Mr. Kuponiwa, retired from Chuga, chairman of the management committee of GBA, Japan Bio Industry Association, chairman of GDP, Greater Tokyo Bio Community and an advisor for the Japan government, he always helps finding the best solution in increasing traction or finding the right partners. In this episode, we were talking about Japanese martial arts, how daily life is in Japan, Japanese meeting culture, the role of informal meetings, and how to negotiate prices in Japan. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Welcome to a new episode of the Life Science Gets Together podcast. Today with a business friend and business partner from Japan. And sorry for that, I have to show off uh, my Starbucks Yokohama, Yokohama cup to be a little bit stereotypical. I love Japan. Stefan, it's very good to see you. How are you doing? Oh, thank you very much. I'm fine, thank you. Um, uh, life here in Japan, of course, we have winter now. But uh, it's not like in my home country, up in the north of Sweden, where they've had almost minus 30 for a few days. Minus, uh, minus 30 degrees. <laughs> in, in yeah, I can do without that. <laughs> how, is, how is the weather in Japan these days? Uh, we have around, I think, eight degrees today and rain. So not a very good day. But we've had, uh, up until today, we've had beautiful days uh, with full sunshine. And in Japan, they say that it's a good sign of the year if you can see uh, Mount Fuji on the 1st of January. That's great. And we saw Mount Fuji for the first five days of, uh, of the new year. So we're hoping that this year will be better. COVID will dissipate and we go back I, to some kind of... <laughs> I believe in that. What I read on the newspapers with the Omicron variant, that it's less lethal. And um, a lot of experts like European Drosten, um, come up with their expectations that finally we'll, we will reach an endemic stage. So I'm pretty positive on that, that we can go back to normal, hopefully. Yes, at least some kind of normal. And I think uh, uh, personally, I will continue to wear a face mask. I mean, all people do it in Japan now. So it's, it, here it doesn't have the stigma of being something that is oppressive or uh, forces you to do something. It's just something you do, like you go out with an umbrella if it rains. I mean, it's nothing strange. That's it. That's, um, a, very, that's a very good hook point. Let me just, uh, for the audience, uh, introduce the topic of today's talk. It's uh, business, business culture, especially the similarities and differences between Japan and Europe. And what you mentioned uh, with the face masks, this was something I experienced on my first trips to Japan. It looked, uh, for me as a European, it looked quite funny. So I asked my friends, uh, it was 2000 something, I asked my friends, why do people wear face masks? And they explained that when someone is sick with the flu, for example, or another respiratory virus, it's pretty normal that when they leave the house, they just cover their faces uh, to not infect other people. Um, and the good thing is um, with you that you live in Japan and experience firsthand the culture in Japan, but also have a background in Europe. You come from Sweden and also understand 
the European culture. So we have a great opportunity now today to discuss uh, what Europeans should be aware of when they go to Japan. Let me ask you the first question. What was the reason for you as a European uh, to move over to Japan? Yeah, uh, so that was sort of 15 years ago. And I was invited to do a small kind of guest study at uh, the University of uh, uh, Kyushu University in Fukuoka, down in the south of Japan. And uh, I just stumbled over this fantastic businesswoman. We have been inseparable ever since. And yeah, we're happily married. So that's how I came to Japan. That's why I stayed. And I also do the martial art kendo, which is a full contact sport. We hit each other with bamboo sticks. And if you do martial arts, of course, being in Japan is like being in heaven. So yeah, those two things pulled me to Japan and I, I couldn't escape. I didn't want to escape. Love is always a good reason to stay in a country and also the love for martial arts. So I can completely <laughs> agree to that. Yeah. Um, how, how long are you training in, in Kendo? For, when did you start? I started very late because I come from a small city up in the north of Sweden where Kendo just didn't exist. I always wanted to do Kendo, but mm -hmm. uh, so I started when I was 28 and it was love at first practice. I, I've never stopped practicing since. And I've actually never felt that going to practice is boring. I, I never had to push myself. So it's obviously something that uh, suits my temperament very much. And uh, now in May of this year, I'm going to try for black belt of the sixth degree. So sixth Rokudan. degree, okay. That's pretty high. That's pretty high in Kendo. Yeah. How, how many how many black belts are there? Oh, I don't. Uh, you mean levels? Yeah, uh, yeah, black. So, so you're sick. I think it's a uh, sixth down. Yeah. Um, after that comes seven, and that is as far as I will probably reach, because eight is uh, it, it's a very small uh, amount of people that get that, and it means perfect Kendo and. Uh, it's like 20 people per year that get mm -hmm. the degree and it's reversed, uh, reserved for the professionals who practice Kendo all their lives. And I'm, I'm not thinking that I will get to their level of expertise. Let's talk a little bit, of, let's stay a little bit with martial arts. Uh, I saw on television uh, a reportage, it was years ago before the pandemic. And uh, in this movie slash reportage, uh, the statement was made that many business people in Japan train in martial arts and especially in Kendo. Is this still true today? And what is the reason why people do that? Uh, so the police, they do either Kendo or Judo mm -hmm. um, because it, they think it makes them better to deal with stressful situations, to have confidence that you have the right reactions and you don't need to be threatening. You can instead wait for the person who is uh, deranged or deluded or not in his right mind. So uh, police violence in Japan is actually extremely low uh, if you compare to all other modern countries. So that, that is one of the official reasons why, why the police do this. Uh, All, I wouldn't say all, but I think most of the bigger companies, they actually have a dojo and to practice karate, aikido, judo, and kendo for their employees. Uh, I have also practiced at the finance ministry. They have their own dojo. It's brilliant. Uh, so, uh, Yeah, so you practice hard and then you drink beer. It's, it's a different <laughs> way of life. I wish we had that in Europe. Did I get it right? Uh, all the big corporations in Japan have their own dojo set up with master teachers where the employees can train in several different Japanese martial arts. Is that the right impression? Uh, I wouldn't say every, every company, and I don't think that every company would offer uh, every martial art that exists, but... Um, 
I know that very many companies do have candle dojos. Um, mm-hmm. So one of my teachers, he came from Orix, Orix, that credit card company. Uh, I am working with JGC, that is a Yokohama company within construction. They they build things like nuclear power plants, and uh, they have a brilliant dojo. IHI, it's another construction company. They also have a big, huge dojo that we go to sometimes. And my own pride, I allow myself one ego pride in in this life. And uh, I'm one one of very few people who practice kendo with the imperial guards, the personal bodyguards of the emperor of Japan. And I practice inside the palace in their dojo. It's a superbly beautiful old school dojo called Sainaikan. So um, exiting the palace through one of their gates and over a small bridge, a stone bridge, uh, it's usually around lunchtime. And mm-hmm. often there are many uh, tourists around and they will say, oh, we want to enter, we want to enter. And the guards stopped them. No, you cannot enter. And they point at me and said, but he could enter. And they say <laughs> things like, yeah, but he's a special guest. And oh, that is such a wonderful ego boost. But I, I don't want to spoil myself. So my ego stops there. So. I, I believe that. And uh, it, on top of that, you have the honor to train in a very historic environment which is uh, plays a, I think, an important role in Japanese culture. And this is, I think, a great hook point to talk a little bit about the uh, Japanese business culture in general. How do you perceive uh, living in Japan as a businessman? But what, what's the speciality of the culture? Uh, I would say that it's it's a very honest culture and your words matter and people are very honest and truthful and open Uh, and we talk about or a lot about respect uh, when I meet people who want to know about Japan and I say well most societies have some kind of respect between people but the Japanese have taken this to a whole new level and you see that also in in uh, uh, business meetings and the way business is conducted. Uh, of course, uh, as always, nothing is 100%. So I would say that is one of the things. And, uh, if, if, if we get to this point of similarities that I think, if you, if you know what is similar, you can come to Japan with confidence in those areas. And so you don't need to think about them. And that is that Japanese people are even more shy than European mm-hmm. people in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I compare to Americans because they are the least shy people in the world. And I think they are commendable for that. And uh, one aspect of the American way of being is that they're very loud. And Japanese people are the opposite of that. And I would say that most Europeans are quiet and mm-hmm. soft spoken. Uh, so that's also something that is very similar. We carry ourselves little similarly. Uh, and one little negative aspect of a similarity that I think is kind of funny is salesmanship. In Japan and Europe, salesmanship is generally kind of small or low, and leaves a lot to be lifted and uh, improved. Compare again to the Americans, they're excellent salespeople, and generally. So, um, so and maybe one more thing. Uh, uh, we, both Europeans and Japanese people, we come with pretty high levels of curiosity, education, and money. Mm-hmm. It's not the poor parts of the world. So I would say those are some of the most striking similarities. It's very difficult to see the similarities because um, you're blind there. But uh, yeah. 
uh, I think about the differences more because they, they are more striking when you come here. I mean, you, you see, trains are on time, but just such a small, simple thing. Buses are on time. The timetables are adapted to the traffic situations, which is something that, at least in Sweden, the traffic companies, were, they are oblivious to these things. That Whoops. <laughs> It was jammed again at five o'clock in the afternoon. We never saw it coming. And next day, the same thing. And also on the platforms, when you travel by train, the train stopped exactly in the right spot where you have markings on the floor where the doors will open. So you form lines waiting. And so the people get off the train, they get off the train and don't disturb anyone. And you get on the train. It's super smooth. Uh, uh, and this thing that people wait in perfect lines. But it's just uh, for anything. Uh, I think Swedish people are pretty good, but still we're messy and we try to get ahead. And, uh, and But it's nothing like Japan. Uh, so there is this next level respectful behavior that uh, that is a difference that you see it Already when you arrive for the first time in Japan, you at the airport, how they give you the passport with two hands, how they just help you. You, you hardly even need to ask for help, and they help you. So it's, it's something that you need to be pretty socially unaware to not notice when you arrive here. Uh, and... You will also notice that the society is calm and quiet. You rarely hear mobile phones ringing. You rarely see anyone talking loudly, self-blogging their lives away over the phone. And um, actually, when you're on the bus, if you start talking on the phone on the bus, the bus driver will stop the bus. <laughs> so you have this immense social pressure to be quiet and silent. And uh, uh, while, it, it while, while, while you're speaking, I'm just walking through my first trips to Japan and you're absolutely right. I mean, the minute I stepped off the airplane, I experienced a huge difference in how people behave. It's um, especially at, uh, at the customs uh, when they very politely ask you, what's, what's your business in Japan? Why are you coming here? And they hand over your passport and bow <laughs> so yeah. to you. And but they are the officials. So um it's very smooth. And um it's despite a lot of people live in Japan, uh it doesn't seem to me that they are in a huge hurry. So this this um you call it uh I think respectfulness or friendliness. Um in Japan I saw a lot of people when I look in their eyes, they smile. So I believe they get a lot of training how to act properly in public. And also what you mentioned on, on, on the train, I mean, here in, in Europe, in Austria or subway, for example, or buses, it's quite normal that you hear a lot of different ringtones, um, people having their phone calls, shouting and screaming and playing off emotions. And on a train in Japan, it's a completely different setting. Uh, on one hand, early in the morning, people sleep. So... It's really quiet on the train. And when they want to communicate, um, even I think 15 years ago, they used their mobile phones. So they were texting and not calling. And this takes so much pressure out of society. It's, it's impressive. Yeah. And uh, especially if you look at the Tokyo area and Kansai area uh, with Osaka, Kyoto, Kobe, mm. We are packed. There is not much space for every person. And I think that with the social pressure, work pressure, and everything that you have, if you also had this I could say, onslaught of noises and sounds and irritations, it, it would be tougher to live in Japan. I, I sometimes joke and say that uh, uh, you know, Swedish people, we are, we have a big country and not many people. So we have lots of space. <laughs> so if we took the 40 million people from metropolitan Tokyo and remove them and exchange them with the 10 million Swedish people that we have in Sweden, uh, we, we would have only 25% of the number of people. But I, 
I'm sure it would be chaos. People would be angry, screaming. There would be traffic jams. And just because the roads are narrow, everything is narrow. And if you're used to big space, I mean, that was the most difficult part for me in the beginning. There were so many people everywhere. I, I couldn't be alone by myself anywhere. It's just endlessly many people. So one, one coping mechanism that I found out was to be in the first uh, at absolute forefront of the train and just look out on the tracks because there are no people there, nothing, no cars, just tracks. It was the calmest place I could find. And of course, home. And after a while, you learn to not look at all the people. You kind of look down instead just to survive because it sometimes feels as if your brain is going to melt. Just too many people. That's absolutely yeah. true. But when I, when I compare it with Vienna, um, I think, uh, I mean, it's not comparable with Tokyo in any case, because in Vienna, we have two million inhabitants. And I think uh, with the commuters, we must be close to 2.5 million, but not more. And as you said, um, the area around Tokyo is uh, 40 million inhabitants on a space. I don't, I don't know the square meters, but I think it's it, it's like Central Europe. So it's not very big. Um, and it's uh, four or five times the uh, the people there. But still, I Vienna looked to me um, more lively than Tokyo in, in a way that people uh, expressed their emotions and expressed their feelings quite openly and uh, had phone calls and ringtones and were chatting loudly. When I was walking through Tokyo, uh, I mean, what impressed me was this silence uh, yeah. on crowded streets and also with a lot of traffic. And I think also the, the Japanese cars are built differently. Can you, uh, is, it, is it still the same or did it change over the last 10 years? I don't think they're built, the cars are not built differently, but uh, they are, I mean, they have the most modern car park in the world. You mm -hmm. rarely see a, a car that is more than three years old. So, uh, uh, of course, the more modern the car is, uh, the more silent it is. And also now with hybrid cars, uh, that usually run on electricity in the cities. I mean, they are silent and quiet. And so, yeah, well, to some extent, of course, they have the local variety of cars. Uh, I'm sure you can find some Toyota or Matsuda brands that you don't find anywhere else. Uh, for instance, these very compact box-like mm -hmm. cars. I haven't seen them in Europe. But I'm I'm not a car fanatic, so I don't know. Uh, and for instance, IKEA, uh, they have a lot of different furniture here than they have in Sweden because Japanese apartments we cannot fit a huge sofa. We need to have a tiny sofa, mm -hmm. and also because Japanese people are smaller, they they don't want to sit in a sofa that is very deep because then the legs will just be pointing straight out. So. You have kind of miniature things. Is it is it to, to, to get the right impression? Is the European and American lifestyle creeping into Japan? What they always liked in Japan was uh, sitting on the floor or kneeling on the floor. Is it still a habit, or uh, did they start to put chairs and sofas everywhere? Well, it it you have both. Uh, I think mm -hmm. Japan is has always been a melting pot, and especially the metropolitan areas. If you go out into outside of the bigger cities, it's like stepping back at least 50 or 100 years. And uh, so one of the pastimes for Japanese people, and I have to admit that I like it a lot too, it's onsen, the hot springs, where you go and there you sit on the floor, uh, you sleep on traditional futon that is just like sleeping on the floor. I mean, it's pointed, it just hurts everywhere when you wake up in the morning. And uh, with brilliant food and stuff. So some restaurants, they put you on the floor. Uh, some restaurants give you chairs. I mean, if you go to a French restaurant, you will have French style eating with French uh, style tables and tablecloths. 
if you go to izakaya which is uh, the japanese i would call it tapas bar maybe with focus on drinking <laughs> but uh, lots of little nibbles that you can order uh, i would say most of them you you will sit on the floor at least in some parts of of the restaurant uh, many restaurants have hole in the floor underneath the table, so it seems that people are sitting on the floor, but it's more kind to your knees. That's true, especially for Europeans who are not used to kneel on the floor. It takes some practice uh, with martial arts, for example, and uh, once you get used to that, you really I really loved it. Um, in, in one of the last podcast episodes with uh, Petina Ressler, I was um, having a conversation about health literacy, and I think still Japan has one of the highest life expectancies in the world. And I believe lifestyle plays a major role in that, uh, especially uh, friendliness, kindness, respectfulness, behavior on the street. And while you were talking, it reminded me of uh, my European rudeness when I traveled first to Japan. So this, you said it in the beginning, this lining up in front of... Uh, restaurants or shops. I was absolutely not used to that. So the first time in Japan, when I tried to enter, a show, um, I think it was uh, an American uh, donut, donut bar, um, I saw this line, but I didn't think that uh, this has a special reason. So people were standing there for whatever reason. And I walked straight in and the waiters and the waitresses uh, rushed at me and talking talking in japan and i didn't understand a single a single syllable i didn't understand what they want from me and tried to walk past them to my friends because they were sitting on a table behind them and one of my friends still lives in japan or lived in japan and uh, he got up and uh, calmed the waitresses and waiters down and then explained to me in german that uh, the next time when you do that that you disrespect lining up uh entire japan will stop <laughs> functioning because you bring a mess to the system and it was a, a nice story i mean uh, i think everybody who wants to go to japan should get a little bit of training before to avoid uh, coming across uh, as a rude person can you name the the, the three uh, major differences europeans should be aware on their first trip uh, to japan what they should do to not come across like this uh roots and uh, uh untrained barbarian or i think gaijin's uh, the same japan yeah uh, barbarian <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's very difficult there are a number of things uh, you need to uh so carry yourself without making noise and lots of movements uh, be, as you explained, all these, it's difficult to call them basic aspects of being respectful, but for instance, not knowing how the system works, it's, I mean, it's impossible. Uh, so I would say, be quiet in trains and buses. That is so important. Even if you travel with your family, be quiet when you travel. And the third thing, which should I choose? Mm. I don't know, uh, just too many things, but uh, I, I will get to a small list of things a little later mm -hmm. in, in the talk. So, um, so if, if, if we talk about selling or being in a negotiation, because that is also transferable to a society, don't push, just don't be pushy. You will not get the deal any faster if you push. Uh, in the West, you may get the deal faster if you push, and it's an accepted behavior. In Japan, it's just plain rude. Uh, and the other part of selling that is also very important in Japan is that uh, all in all countries, you oversell a little bit to make your product seem more interesting. In Japan, that is almost a criminal offense because it means you're lying and then they cannot trust you. So the Japanese standard is to undersell. So it's a very strange thing when you meet a salesperson for the first time and they show you this product and they say, yeah, um, I should start with saying that this product is not as good as our competitor's products. It costs more and has less functionality. That's 
that would be a very ordinary, normal Japanese way of setting up the first sales meeting for a product. And all the sales coaches outside of Japan, they would go crazy and say, no, you need to learn how to sell because you don't know how to. But that's how it's done here. And it's just the way things are. Uh, yeah, I would, I I would uh, let, let, let's uh, stay a little bit at this part. I think because it's important. I would I would call it the. I would say that the maybe not so much European. I think more the the US lifestyle is more transactional. So you go in for one transaction, and I perceive the Asian culture, especially the Japanese one, uh, as being more relational. So relationships matter the most. And uh, for example, saving face and not being offensive, uh, building relationships, getting to know people. Uh, is a key point on selling. So it takes a lot of time until the first closing, especially when it comes to to higher value sales. Um, it was the impression I got years ago. Is it still that way that uh, in Japan, But, relationships yeah. matter the most? Yeah, so uh, not that relationship matter the most, but you cannot do business before you know the company you're doing business with. And... It also has this very important part that uh, you do business, people do business with people, but they represent companies. So the relationships need to be in place first. So the simplified way of saying this is that in the West, we get to the contract as soon as possible. We sign the contract and then we start finding a way to have a good relationship. It takes a while, but we will get there. Uh, in Japan, they don't do business until they have a good relationship. So it's basically the same time frame to have a good relationship to do business with in Japan as it is in the West. Mm -hmm. But it's a much more smooth, painless uh, process because you iron out all the differences before you start doing business. You get to know each other perfectly well and the products and the services, whatever it is, perfectly well. Uh, of course, I, I need to underline that this is for business to business relationships. When you sell to consumer, uh, if you're working with consumer products, mm -hmm. it, it has a very different set of rules. But uh, you would probably want to have a distributor. And with a distributor, you would have to set up the business accordingly. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about your business background to just frame the part about the business, where you're coming from. What, what, what's your business? So uh, my educational background is chemical engineering and school medicine. I never worked in those disciplines. Uh, I worked as, uh, I say, I worked with leadership and business development mainly. I've been... Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, so I set up a number of companies. I've also been CEO for a public Swedish company in, in the industrial area or heavy industries. Uh, so I, I have a little bit of mixed background. And um, here in Japan, I, after some trial and horror, came up with the understanding that it's easiest for me if I work with the pharmaceutical or biopharma or that part of the industry because uh, I'm struggling a little bit with the Japanese language. I don't have it on the level where I can sit and do negotiations on the business level. But uh, in this industry, many people speak English, so it's not a bad handicap. And I've also teamed up with uh, Japanese people, so it kind of mitigates that issue. Uh, so we help with business development, uh, mainly uh, Japanese entities that uh, I would call it uh, Western or global companies or Western companies that have a Japanese uh, branch office, something like that, that have run into issues or they want to set it up or they want to increase traction or they have realized that their strategy isn't working, they need a better one. So with all those things, it's very good to have someone to look at your, your situation with outsider's eyes. So we are those eyes. We lend to our clients 
our collective business acumen. And since we've been doing this, uh, my partner has been doing it for even longer than I have. So it's, we can with confidence say which ones we can help and not. And if, if we cannot help you, we would show you to someone who we think could. So. Do, you, do you have a case study that we can talk about to exemplify uh, how that works to make, let's call it landfall in Japan? Um, in my business uh, environment, many people recognize that Japan is an interesting market. Um, they So just to give you a little bit of background where the audience is coming from, probably or probably not, um, some traveled to Japan and um, went to some conferences and tried to set up business relations. But um, after six, seven, eight months, they came back very frustrated and said, okay, I mean, it's impossible as a non-Japanese person um, to set up business in Japan because they are actually not talking with you. Um, what is the proper right way from your experience to engage with Japanese companies? Oh, the proper right way. Um, you, uh, you need to have their fingers fits in the <laughs> in all the different relationships. Um, what's the, it's impressive. You also speak German quite well, so fingers fits in the food. Is it? But what's the English term for that? Is it the the, the, uh, the, 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 the I don't know feeling. I, uh, but uh, I think that the, the German word is a perfect one mm -hmm. because it, that's what you need to have. Every business meeting is different, has a different objective, has different uh, stakeholders. So you need to look upon every meeting as being prepared. And you asked for a, 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 a study. So I will give you one. So this company that I, that I work for, their name is Bioforum. It's a British mm -hmm. company. I help them in Japan. I've been helping them for two years now. And I really enjoy working with them. They organized the bio industry Uh, not like an industrial organization per se, but more like a membership community. Mm -hmm. And they organized the big players in the world. And for five years in Japan, trying to sell and set up memberships without any kind of major success, I would say. They, they had some success, but uh, not what they should have. Uh, so we sat down and talked, and uh, one of the things we found out after a while was that they didn't know the ecosystem well enough. So we studied the ecosystem for them, helped them understand why business isn't so self-evident here. And uh, we also um, decided that it would be very good to set up a strategic partnership with the JBA, which is Japan Bioindustry Association. Mm -hmm. And uh, upon doing so, use the JBA platform as a, a platform for conducting seminars on very, very interesting topics with the world leading subject matter experts from the leading companies as a way to show uh, the Japanese industry how good we are I, i say we now because i feel like i belong to this company after <laughs> so it's such a long time and also what the use is um, so i have managed now to get a number of uh, new memberships here in japan and i have you know it's more like the ketchup bottle effect where You start slowly, the, the first memberships come like, oh, they are very, almost like deer, <laughs> carefully looking out from the forest. But uh, I think that uh, within this year or sometime early next year, we will see the ketchup bottle drop and all the memberships that should have been there already five years ago will be there. So that's what I'm looking for to create. Uh, together with them and this was not self-evident to them this was not even self-evident to the jba they never worked with a company before and much less a foreign company they only had members so it took a lot of coaxing it took a lot of meetings um, 
so formal meetings and informal meetings, and, and those are very important aspects of doing business in Japan. So, um, so I, I think so. The formal meetings in Japan, if you go to a business meeting, it's to establish common ground. This is what we agree upon. This is what we know, and just make everybody smile in the mm -hmm. meeting. Then you have the informal meetings. Um, so that if you don't know this, you will go to a, a formal meeting and you will think, oh, yeah, they're going to buy. They're going to buy. They are so positive. And then you get to the informal meeting at the restaurant in the evening and they will just tell you, no, we're not going to buy because it's too expensive. Or we found a better vendor. Uh, so the informal meetings are for uh, ironing out things to uh, whether uh, differences to whether expectations that are can 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 we stop a little bit here because I think it's important. So the impression I got uh, when negotiating with Japanese people is that in this what you call official meetings, uh, usually those meetings where many people attend. So you have. Uh, Sometimes always also people that are not directly involved with with this deal, and uh, I think one speciality of Japanese culture is that they want to make their business partners look good uh, in front of other people. So the they you called it uh, they say a lot of positive words and a yeah. lot of calming words, just for the reason, in my opinion, to to make sure that uh, everybody looks good in the meeting. So this is just the way of Japanese politeness. And these informal meetings, the impression I got was. Very often they are one-to-one, one-on-one. So very small groups or it's just face-to-face. -face. And in these meetings, you can talk very directly with them and they appreciate that and openly, but it's a one-to-one -one setting. So when they criticize, they don't do it in public um, or when they complain about something, they don't do it in public, but they do it on one-on-one. -on -one. Did they get the right impression or did they miss something? That is completely right. And I, I could add a little bit color to that painting, I think, because... Uh, uh, these formal meetings with many people, they do play a very central role in the uh, Japanese way of doing business because there will not be a decision made until there is consensus within mm -hmm. all the people who would possibly ever be involved in the project working with you. So they go to these meetings to listen to all the things that you agree on. And of course, they want you to look good because if you look strange or you're noisy and problematic in the meeting, some people will think, mm, I will not give my consensus vote so easily. Okay. So, yeah. so if you understand it from that context, it becomes much more clear, I think. So before attending meetings, it would be good to get some training in proper meeting behavior, I guess. Uh, well, just control yourself. But I think in order to navigate uh, doing business in Japan, you either need to study hard and learn by yourself, which takes mm -hmm. a couple of years, or you take someone by the hand, like a consultant or a local person that you want to hire or work with, because you may want to set up a small sales office just with someone. So you need someone who can interpret what happens. And, and also, this is a little abstract thing, but you need to interpret also the things that do not happen in the meeting, which means you have to have a very clear understanding of what to expect or not to expect. What, what, what are these, uh, can you can name a few things of uh, what's not happening in a meeting that's uh, important, so the absence of something? Okay, so for instance, the absence of questions, Mm -hmm. it would show that they are not interested. Uh, the more interested they are, the more questions you would have, <clears throat> and vice versa. If you are not interested in these people that you're meeting, you will not have many questions. And um, I, I, it's kind of self-evident if you think of it that way. But I come from the Swedish culture where questions means that maybe you're unprepared or maybe you're a little behind Mm -hmm. up in the brain so <laughs> sorry <laughs> this is, I, 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 I never i never saw it that way it's it's uh <laughs> yeah, yeah but so we all come from different uh, ways of seeing things but so asking questions shows interest not asking questions doesn't show interest mm -hmm. uh, and 
if you have commentary from the highest rank of uh, officer of, of the of the opposing table, that is very good. If you have commentary, if he's only quiet, that doesn't need to be bad. Mm-hmm. But it's better if there is some commentary from from that person. Asking Over questions. Which, so we were we were in meetings that it's uh, a good thing when Japanese people ask questions. I think it's also true for the, the European or US parties to be prepared and uh, to come up with questions and not just sit there and listen. Is it is it the right expectation or the right picture I got? Yes, yes. And uh, also, uh, one thing that would be a little confusing is that uh, the next meeting you have, they will sometimes ask the same questions. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, my mindset was that, okay, uh, they didn't quite get the answer, so I changed the answer a little bit to get it from a different angle. And for Japanese people, that's very confusing because <laughs> okay. then I'm saying a different thing. They just want to check that I say the same mm-hmm. thing, that they, they want to hear exactly the same answer. So is it, is, it a, is it a matter of trust then that they initially they, they try to establish trust to find out, uh, can, can I trust you to say, do you say the same thing or to, do you change your story? Is that uh, a way we could see that? Yeah, so definitely. If you stick to one story over and over again, they will, it will inspire trust, yes. Which means and, a lot of preparation before the meeting. So to know what uh, you want to say uh in a series of meetings and not change the story of, uh around i mean it's, it's just I, i think to the european startup world so where it's quite common uh to change stories every couple of days and uh just think about negotiating for example with japanese investors it might be better to sit back prepare the story and then go out with a consistent story on the market rather than changing the story over a course i mean When do Japanese people invest? I guess it, they also take their time to, 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 to look at the companies and uh, evaluate the companies and build trust. So there should be one flow then. Is it the right picture? Yes, but also, I mean, change does happen, and especially in startup companies. And you cannot hide that. Uh, mm-hmm. But you should be more honest uh, with the change uh, to give the reasons for. Okay, since the previous meeting, when we said this, This has changed because of something, something, something. So this is the new way. And if you do it that way, you remove the confusion. But you may move also backwards a little bit. So they need to see if this sticks. Yeah. What, what else is, uh, you said that we were at the point of uh, the absence of something. So one thing is question. Uh, a good sign that the party is not interested is when they just listen to the meetings and uh, leave the room and ask absolutely zero questions. Uh, what's another one? Uh, so as I said, it, depending on the highest rank ranking officer, uh, he should have some commentary. And like when you're leaving the room and thanking everyone, he should say something. That's a very positive sign. And if he doesn't, it's not a positive sign. It, it can be that he's very busy and needs to run to a different meeting. But uh, usually it's good. It, it's bad if he doesn't. Let, uh, let me ask you, let me ask you, sorry to interrupt, let me just, uh, uh, a thought that popped up in my mind. I mean, we are talking about business meetings. So yeah. meetings usually have a defined starting point and a defined end point. Um, When I look to Europe, especially with the mobile culture, um, sometimes it feels to me that it became more and more practice uh, to push starting points of meetings backwards or to come up 10 minutes before the meeting that uh, one or the other participant may be uh, too late for the meeting. So they will come in 10, 15 minutes later when the meeting already starts. And sometimes people just run over time. Uh, how is that in Japan? Is it uh, is it wise to try to stay on time, so to uh, arrive early, oh, start yes. the meeting at the right point in time, and also end it at the right point in time? How how do Japanese people handle that timing problems? Well, as I told you, this this is a respectful thing because you need to respect that all the people participating they have their own schedules that they need to adhere to. So it's disrespectful to not let them work on their schedules. It's very important to 
to make sure that you start on time, end on time. Everything is prepared, nothing fails. Uh, I mean, sometimes, of course, with modern technology, the computer image doesn't present itself on the projector. It just happens. You need to reboot mm -hmm. everything and hopefully works. But, but uh, especially the ending point is very important. You, uh, the Japanese meetings, when they want to stop, don't give an extra question or an extra comment because they will politely listen. And what you miss then is the end part where you say goodbye to each other and thank each other for the meeting and and hope to get some kind of comments like, or this is also where you pinpoint the person that you need to speak to at, at an informal meeting and say, I will contact you. Uh, and they know exactly what it means. Uh, and what, what does it mean? What does it mean when they say, I, con I will contact you? Yeah, that we will have uh, an informal meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's when you discuss the nitty gritty of the deal, push things forward. Uh, change requests, uh, negotiating a, an agreement that there is this one provision that we cannot agree on, you need to discuss it. And those are the things you do not do in the formal meetings, because the formal meetings are only for the agreed things. And up until you can sign the contract, you need to have a lot of informal meetings with various people. And it's good if you have someone to guide you so that you get the informal meeting with the right person. What? What? Can we can we talk a little bit more about the informal meetings? Uh, so you mentioned we have the first formal meeting, and at the end of the meeting, uh, <coughs> Japanese people will say, uh, "I will contact you." So this is uh, something that uh, I. Assume... Or you ask them. You ask to contact the right okay. person. Okay, so, so it's also polite to say, okay, let me follow up with you or contact you. And But this yeah. means uh, I would invite then the Japanese person out for dinner or for, for lunch. So it's an informal meeting then, not, a, not an official yeah, one. Pre-COVID, it was like that. You would go for drinks. But mm -hmm. uh, now it's usually uh, some of these things, matters can be conducted by email. And sometimes you should use not your business email address, but your private email address. Private, private email. Yeah. This is a huge difference because I always hear in, um, in Europe and also in the United States that it looks unprofessional to use yes. a private email address. Yeah, but for informal things, it, it, then it's off the record. Okay. And in Japan, you also have something called a smartphone email address. They are used less and less now. But uh, so... Everybody used to have at least two email addresses. And so you set up this means. So pre-COVID, it was usually you go for drinks, a few beers or something, discuss things, or small restaurant to visit. Uh, but now you do it online, usually. Or some of the topics can be fixed using emails. So uh, And... The good thing with the uh, informal meetings is that it's a little bit like, I would guess, if uh, how spying works. You mean Putin cannot speak directly to the prime minister of Sweden. He, the meeting had, needs to be set up by other people who are lower on the scale. Mm -hmm. So... And I think that this, this is the same thing in Japan, that you need to just set things up so the boss, he gets something that is agreed with everybody and everything is fine, it's vetted, it's due diligence done, all the tick boxes, all the stamps, everything is complete. Then you present it to the director and he will say, hmm, have you thought this through? And the boss you have, he will say, yes. Okay, I approve. It may, may take a month, but uh, you want to get to the stage where everything is set up perfectly. And so a lot of underhandling or under the table discussions are needed. There's a lot of politics and negotiation uh, going on until uh, people come to a deal, to signing, to signing off a deal. Yeah, I think that the politics, so uh, 
it's mainly inside of big corporations where you have political movements, mm. not in between companies. But you can get stuck in uh, politics because you will have this yes, 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 yes. And then finally it says no, because, you know, anything can happen. And nothing is sure until the contract is signed. And actually not even then, but less unsure. I mean, when it takes longer to sign a contract, I guess uh, the failure rate after signing uh, is probably lower than in the United States, where contracts. Yeah. Are, uh, makes my impression. Maybe my impression is wrong, but I always got the impression that uh, the U.S. people are very quick to signing, and as you said, uh, they negotiate the relationship afterward after the signing, which means that the rate of failure might be higher in U.S. than in Japan. Did you ever do some statistics uh, on that? Uh, I have one interesting fact. It's not exact, but almost mm -hmm. in. New York, Manhattan alone, you have more business lawyers than you have lawyers in all of Japan. Okay. <laughs> this is, this is, yeah. <laughs> and also Japanese contracts, they, uh, you know, you have, usually in Europe, we would have a clause that says, in case we cannot agree, we will take this to some court or someone to make a decision for us. Mm -hmm. But in Japan, we don't do that. Uh, only as a very last measure. It, it's written in contracts that you need to solve issues amicably. And if you cannot do that, it means you're a very problematic person or you represent a company that nobody is going to want to work with. So it, there is this huge pressure to actually solve matters, to, to preserve the relationship. And it's always easier when there is not money involved. But uh, I, I would mean, say that there's a negotiation with Japan. I mean, this is a, would be a huge, still a huge topic. It just reminded me of one story a friend of mine told me a couple of years ago, where um, a European friend of him, of him uh, training in martial arts and wanted to buy a Japanese sword. Um, and this guy was from uh, the Middle East. So in the Middle East, it's quite normal that when you want to buy something, uh, you start negotiating the price. And uh, people are happy to do so. And it's, it's, it's uh, part of their culture. And this guy went into a Japanese sword shop, uh, willing to buy a very expensive sword. And so the sword uh, and price was fine for him. But... Uh, Due to his cultural background, he had the great idea to start negotiating with the swordsmith. Uh, and as a result, the swordsmith just canceled the negotiation and threw this guy out of the shop and they never come back. Um, so not literally, but uh, figuratively, because he ended the negotiation and no deal was set in place. And I asked my friend, why? Why, why did that happen? I mean, um, it's not a bad thing to negotiate. And the answer I got was, it's very impolite to dis disrespect the price and express uh, clearly that you believe the price of a sword is too high. It's one of the most disrespectful things that you can do to a Japanese uh, business owner to uh, give him the impression in public uh, that he is charging too much for something. Um, is this uh, still a story that you see in, in Japan in negotiating that uh, there are certain rules that people should be aware uh, when it comes to pricing, uh, that they should not start negotiating uh, the price of this fact? So the price in a shop is non-negotiable. Mm. Okay. And same thing with taxis, same thing with everything. But uh, when it comes to business-to-business uh, -business negotiations, the price, uh, the, I mean, you, you set a budget, etc. And even if the price is very difficult to change, you, you still, there, there is some leeway. Yeah, so there, the, the problems are uh, in, in private settings, you cannot. Uh, in business settings, you can to some extent. But for instance, if you want to buy ball bearings, say, and you want to slash the price with 10%, you will be met with very much uh, confusion 
because uh, those 10 percent will be translated into kind of change of materials or change of design or cutting off something because they at least they want to think that they set the prices extremely honestly uh, i would say it's to a very big extent it's completely true uh, of course sometimes prices are i mean there are also japanese companies that are uh, opportunistic but uh, so price is a very sensitive thing to discuss in japan and you should do it uh, very carefully that's true stefan i think we went through very interesting uh parts to get a better insight into japanese culture maybe we should do another call um uh to go into more detail into more depth um we said uh one hour that we uh, uh <laughs> have a one hour talk and i could ask more and more questions it's very uh insightful to learn from you as you are living in japan and know how things work uh let me ask you one final question um Let's assume an, a European company wants to make landfall in Japan. Uh, what is the first step that you recommend they should do to maximize uh, the probability of success in their approach to Japan? Uh, I think if, if you look at this as a ladder on how to uh, get from an idea, you start with the idea that Japan might be a good Uh, market for us. I, I think you should maybe first just dip your toes in Japan, go to a trade show, uh, at least visit something in Japan just to get the taste and the feeling. And uh, then you should formulate some kind of entry strategy. I do recommend you do it with people who know a lot about Japan because so many things will be different from what you're expected and used to. So the entry strategy, uh, I usually think of it as uh, first and foremost, understanding the ecosystem that you want to be a part of, uh, the industrial organizations, the competitors, the partners, the distributors, and those things. And you need to have a very clear idea who to work with. So you would have target lists for that. So that's the entry strategy. Uh, when you start working on the entry strategy, I mean, the pragmatic work to actually con start conducting business in Japan, you need to have feet on the ground. There are many reasons for this. One, one is that if, if you don't exist in Japan with an office and things, you would be like a ghost, which means mm -hmm. they don't know if you exist or where you exist. So it's it's just what things are. So uh, after that, you, you will need help to open doors because uh, LinkedIn is useless. You, you don't get any contacts that way. You need to either meet people at trade shows or seminars or like that, or you need to uh, do it the old fashioned way, meaning private or, or personal people. Uh, personal uh, invitations or recommendations by people. And uh, uh, after that, you will need someone to not only initialize, but also strengthen and uh, maintain your, your business relationships here in Japan. And uh, I would say the last thing is that You can speed things up a lot by tapping into somebody else's business acumen in Japan. And uh, we said there are three things that we require from our clients. We need them to have an ambition. That's number one. Two, they need to have a budget for entering Japan. Mm -hmm. And three, we need to agree on how to do this so that there is a balance between ambition, bad budget, time, expectation. Yeah, long answer from your short question, but I I wanted to keep it a little relevant. So the the best recommendation is to contact you uh, and uh, to get some first, uh, I would say, 
some first hints on how to to oh, proceed yeah. in japan i mean we, we welcome people to contact us it doesn't cost anything to say hello we're thinking about japan or we have an issue in japan and set up a meeting and discuss it uh, i mean that's that's only good if we can be helpful i, I think that uh, one of the things that we are trying to do here is to help strengthening an industry and one of the most important things in doing that is to uh, just be open to all the different kinds of talent that flows it can be companies products uh, raw materials just anything that flows between <laughs> i'm sorry the dog is very happy yes it looks like looks like nice dog nice dog with some toys <laughs> yeah okay but uh, let me stop it here I, i would very much look forward to speak to you again um, that's true so stefan i would recommend everybody who's interested from the audience uh, to make landfall in japan to reach out to you i will post your linkedin profile and uh your website uh, in the description to the podcast And I wish you, your wife and your dog and your team a great time in Japan and uh, let's catch up soon. Thank you very much. It was great talking to you. Thank you. Have a bye great bye. day. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please, please share the podcast and make sure you've subscribed. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.